Yeah, we're going to continue on, on the financial aspect of this, and I want to introduce Kevin Murphy, uh, Murphy and Robert uh, Topol, who are going to present findings from their paper, The Value of Health and Longevity. Uh, this, is, this is a uh, legendary paper that won the Kenneth J. Arrow Award for the best research paper in health economics. Um, their research uh, developed a framework for economically valuing improvements in, in health and longevity and, and begins to just answer the question, how much is, is health worth? Uh, Kevin Murphy is the George J. Stigler Distinguished Service Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business, and Robert Topol is the Isidore Brown and Gladys Brown Distinguished Service Professor in Urban and Labor Economics, also at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks for having us. Um, we weren't quite sure of the, the organization of the venue, so this is going to be a little bit like a Grateful Dead concert. We're going to. Um, I've reached the age <clears throat> where I'm leaving body parts behind, like it's destruction derby, <laughs> and so I mean, as, as sort of a you know symbolic of the kind of things we're talking about. Um, I figured as long as I'm coming to Washington, D.C., and I need a hip replacement, well, it turns out the guy who does the really best minimally invasive procedure is here in D.C. So with just two weeks' notice, I called him up and said, I'd like to come and see it. So yesterday afternoon, I went to see him, and now here I am to talk about how we've... And we, so we're lucky we live in an age that we can get... We can just replace parts as we go, and maybe by, if I reach 150, there won't be any of me left. <laughs> Um, with this is feel free to jump in, you know. Um, Don't worry, I will. <laughs> this is uh, uh, what we're going to talk about is something that we began back in about 2000, a project. And the president of our university came to us and asked, you know, what's medical research worth? And we were not we're not by training health economists, so we said, well, we don't know, but we'll think about it. And we did, and then the story grew in the telling. And, and then here today, we got to hear that our paper is legendary. I've never had a legendary paper, so I want, I, I want to thank you for that. Um, but what we, what we, the, the problem we approached is, well, on the benefit side, what's um, not just medical research. We didn't want to frame it so narrowly. What have health gains and what have longevity gains been worth? And what would they be worth prospectively? And the answer is that they're very valuable. And we approach the problem the way economists do because we're economists. So the value that people get from um, increased health, increased longevity, we'll talk about that mainly here today, um, it isn't because they're more productive or um, it doesn't make GDP bigger or doesn't create jobs in some congressmen's congressional district. I remember being asked when we first did this stuff by a senator, they said, oh, this is a really great professor, uh, but how many jobs will this create in my state? And, and it's not about that. So to understand that point, that we, in, the way we think of it as economists is how much are people willing to pay for these increases in longevity, because that's the way economists value everything. Um, to, to sort of conceptualize it, think about the fact that since uh, in, in recent times, most of the gains in longevity have come at older ages. It's not like early on in the 20th century where it came from reducing infant mortality and childhood diseases and, 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 and other public health measures. Um, it's come from older ages, reductions in heart disease, reductions in mortality from cancer and the like. Well, most of those gains are coming at age 65 and over. Well, those people aren't really, on average, there's a lot of them working, but on average, a lot of those people are retired. You wouldn't want to say that those life years that they're gained are not worth anything. So um, I mean, worse than that, people would say it's it's bad because it right they they require additional pension benefits and more strain on the healthcare and social security system. You really want to say, you know, people. The evidence is people value living longer and they value it a lot. If you look at places where people have to make a choice about how much they value their lives and how much they value longevity, the, all the empirical evidence is people value it a lot. It's right. very important to them. And, 
and, and one way to look at it is, and we've often done this in terms of kind of a choice. Think about if I offered you the following choice. I'm, I'm going to take you back and eliminate the last, say, 113 years of progress, and I'm going to take you back to 1900. So I'm going to take you 113 years into the past, but I'm going to be nice to you, and I'm going to let you take something with you. And you got a choice. You can either take today's longevity, but give up all that wealth increase and income increase that we had. So you're going to go back to 1900 income, but you're going to keep today's longevity. Or we're going to take you back in time, and you can keep the income, but you're going to lose the longevity. That's really your choice. Do you want the material side, but, or do you want the longevity side? Let, let's give them a number. The longevity side is the following. In, in 1900, 18% of newborn males died before their first birthday. And by 2000, it wasn't until age 62 where 18% of the males had been taken off the, taken out of, out of the game. So expected life, in, life expectancy at birth increased by about 30 years between 1900 and 2000. Right, but we're also a lot wealthier, many, yeah. many fold wealthier than we were in 1900. And we use evidence on what people are willing to pay to live longer in terms of what they're willing to pay to, say, reduce their risk of on-the-job injury and the like. And let me first ask you guys, which one would you choose? Would you take the money or take the longevity? How many you can still have your cell phone and everything, but you got to have your health from 1900. Yeah, you're going to have life expectancy of 40-something years. Yeah, oh, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, real income, real, real income. It's the real you deal. You can live the same. You still got your flat screen TV, your cell phone, and all that stuff, and you're going to go back to 1900, but your life expectancy is 43 years or whatever, and you're going to die with 18% chance of dying before your first birthday, and you got to take all of it. So you either get the hell or, or you get the deal. money. I mean, that's really the yeah, choice. You can't say, I want, the, you know, I want to take my cell phone, but I don't want to take my Twitter account or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, 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 and our number, how, well, first, how many people would take the money? <laughs> and how many people would take the health? Yeah, okay. okay. Well, I mean, I think see, our, our see, numbers are kind of consistent with our, that. Our numbers come out that the, uh, between over the century, for both men and women, it came out to be about worth about $1.2 million per person. Which is to say that if I offered you the $1.2 million, would you take 1,900 health? If you think it's a close call, then you probably think our numbers are pretty good measure of, um, of what people gained in terms of life years over that century. But, but that adds some real perspective on things because we often think about economics in terms of how much better off we are in terms of wealth and all these other things. And we ignore the fact that we've probably got at least as much value from longevity. And what that means is longevity is on the table there with everything else in the economy. That is, all the improvements in you know, computers and communications and everything else totaled up is roughly the same or even a little smaller than what we've gotten from increased longevity. So I think that makes a discussion like we're having here today really important because all the economic evidence is longevity is really important to people. And these numbers don't really account for the changes in quality of life that have gone along with health and improvements. So the fact that I can get a hip replacement or a knee replacement or, or whatever and live those live the years I might have lived otherwise but live them in a more comfortable way, we're not counting those numbers. And if you just look at the changes in longevity from 1970 to the end of the century, those were worth in total just in the United States alone to men and women about 95 trillion. It comes out to be a flow of about $3 trillion a year. Now keep in mind that GDP is about 15 trillion, 14 trillion. So we're talking about a pretty large and uncounted flow of value. We call it health capital in our work. That's not counted in the traditional welfare or per capita income statistics. And it changes your perspective on certain periods of time as well. So that the 1970s were often considered in terms of GDP growth, a period of fairly low growth. Whereas the 1960s were 
thought of as a high growth period. Well, if you look at the changes in the flow of health capital over those two periods, it kind of reverses your perspective because we didn't make all that much progress health-wise in the 1960s, but after 1970, we did. And that's when, the, that's when especially for men, men started catching up a little bit to women. The, 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 both, both men and women gained, but men started gaining more relative to women after 1970. There'd been a long sl slowdown in male progress from about 1940 to 1970. Yeah, so over the whole period, men and women gained just about the same. Women pulled ahead in the early part of the 20th century, and the men have been kind of catching up ever since in terms of uh, the, the cumulative gains that they received. So that's really one element of good news. The good news is we've had a big increase in longevity, and not only is it quantitatively significant, it's economically significant in that in terms of improving people's lives, it's as important as the rest of the economy put together. So that, that's a piece of good news. Second piece of good news is we have a lot of prospective gains out there to be had as well. We estimate, for example, a 10% reduction in cardiovascular disease and, in fact, a 10, or a 10% reduction in, in death rates from cancer has a present value that is a cumulative future value of about $5 trillion for either one of them. That's it's in the United States. That's the United States. That's just the U.S. And if you think of the the technologies that would cause that kind of thing, we've done this. We've we've done these conversations a lot with the with on panels with doctors and stuff. And you ask them, well, you know, could you reduce mortality from cancer by ten percent? And they say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Give us the research money. Give us mm -hmm. the research money. But the the um, the, those 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 numbers are. They would say that even if they couldn't. But that's right. 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 <laughs> that's besides those, the point. Those, the, those those numbers are those are those are big numbers. But keep one thing to keep in mind is they're the purely the benefit side of the of the calculus. We haven't we're not we'll we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the cost side. It, it it matters what it costs you to achieve those gains. So the way I would typically phrase it is: Look at if to get those five trillion dollars in present value, and that's in the U.S. alone. It I get a hook every one of you up to your own personal nuclear reactor. It might not be a good, a, a cost-effective uh, 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 gain. Whereas mm -hmm. if somebody can come up with a technology that can give you those gains by just taking a pill every day, then it, it's got a lot of, to an economist in a cost-benefit analysis, that's got a lot of value. And that comes back to a, more, a, a broader point that we make, which is, um, the value of these gains depends on the costs of achieving them. And um, some health gains may be worth achieving if medical resources are allocated efficiently down the road, um, whereas if medical resources aren't allocated efficiently down the road, say because of third-party payer systems and things like that, or sometimes we call it, you know, build it and they will use it. It's like the movie, build it and they will come. Um, then it may not be worth investing in those, those gains because we're going to waste a lot of resources in how we allocate the medical resources in the future. Yeah, I mean, I think a good way to think about it is, and, and this really changes your view on what's important, and you go to talk to people in Washington, you talk to them about medical research, and you talk to the researchers, and they say, look at all the great things we could do if we had more medical research. And then you go talk to the people who have to pay for it, and they're like terrified of all the things that could be done if you actually had to pay for it. And in some sense, they're both right, because think about like the cancer. We said $5 trillion for a 10% reduction in cancer. And in our experience, even recently in cancer, historically in cardiovascular disease, is that kind of progress is possible. It's not pie-in-the-sky stuff to say we could reduce death rates by 10%. And that's worth $5 trillion. So let's say somebody proposes a $200 billion war on cancer, big increase in cancer funding, $200 billion war on cancer, with the goal being to get this $5 trillion in improved longevity. And they say, well, we're not sure whether it's going to be successful or not. So maybe, maybe, but it, the $200 billion, even if it has a one in 10 chance is clearly going to be worth it if the only thing you get is the benefit. We have slides on this, but we're not showing them to But you. The, the, the important question, though, is what's that treatment going to cost? 
And if that treatment costs 10, bill, 10 trillion to give it to everybody, it's not worth it. If it costs 3 trillion, it's clearly worth it. And what's not very important in that calculation is the 200 billion. That number is so small compared to the other two key elements. The key elements in this debate are about what's the value of, of in longevity, and that's a huge number, and what's the cost of treatment. And that's the other potentially huge number. The cost of the research itself is like round off error in this calculation. It really doesn't matter very much whether the, whether the war on cancer costs 200 billion, 300 billion, 100 billion. In the game we're playing, in the game of raising longevity, it's all about the increased value, which we know is there. The key remaining question is the cost of care. And that's why we like to say, look, if we can get a sane health system that spends money when it's worthwhile and doesn't spend money when it's not worthwhile, that unlocks the benefits of research because it eliminates the key downside of research. The key downside of a $200 billion war on cancer is not that it won't come up with anything. It's that it'll come up with something that costs so much that we end up bankrupting ourselves in the process of trying to implement it. We like to say it's unaffordable success is really the greatest risk. And if you can take unaffordable success off the table, research becomes much more valuable as an input. And we really can say we can continue this train rolling. We can continue this train of increased longevity rolling. And the big worry is, and if you look over the 20th century, we had this progress in longevity, just we kept <clears throat> making longevity longer. The big difference is the cost of increasing that longevity has been going up and up as we've had more and more expenditures on more and more expensive treatments. And that the need to balance that cost is more important today than it was in the past. But, but let us know, that, that sounds, Kevin makes it sound depressing. Give it, let me give you a, a, a slightly brighter <laughs> spin on it. We also backed out, you know, we just compared the gains in longevity between 1970 and the early 2000s to the increase in medical expenditure in the United States. And one of the things we always talk about is how fast medical expenditure is increased in the U.S. and how big it is as a share of GDP in the U.S. compared to other places. But actually, given the, the longevity gains we got, we're worth about three times the increase in, in medical expenditure. Now, I didn't say that the medical expenditure caused the uh, other. All I'm telling you is that what we gained in terms of total health was much more valuable than what we spent over that period, the increase in spending over that period of time. Yeah, and, that, and, and the key is to keep that going. I think, you know, we have found for some, in some areas and for some groups of the population, we do find that the increase in cost is approaching, and in a few cases, even exceeding the increase right. in longevity. So, but the point is, it doesn't, the point is you don't want to give up the increased value of longevity just because there's potential costs. And then you might ask yourself, well, why do we have this problem of unaffordable success? We don't worry about it in other areas, right? We don't worry about people inventing really expensive TV sets that people will that cost more than people value them. Why? Because people won't buy them. People aren't going to invest in things that they won't develop things that people won't buy. But if you created a system that said if you big, if you invent a really big expensive flat screen TV your and you have to give it to everybody who wants one. Your insurance that company will pay be, for it. Yeah, that <laughs> might not be such a great idea. And the, the, the notion that it's very difficult in the kinds of, of uh, allocation mechanisms that we have to deny a technology to people once it's invented. Yes, or, or to use it appropriately. Yeah. Use it on in cases where it's cost effective and not use it in others. And we're going to turn it over to Q&A. So uh, the bottom line of what we're saying is if you're trying to say, how do we get the most out of research, one of the answers is improve the delivery system because a better delivery system is going to feed back and lead to a better research system and really allows us to open the spigot on research. Uh, 
So why don't they ask us to ask for questions? So turn it out. Are you want to hand you want to hand the microphone around, or we just let them go? Go here. You've been. You've been I think you need a microphone. Otherwise, right. we can hear, but not everybody yeah. else. All right. Um, hi, I'm I'm William Angel again. Um, you mentioned at the end of your speech um, that the you know the the issue of allocating valuable technologies like this, uh, given given how expensive you know effective uh, extreme longevity is likely to be in the near future, how. Do you have any ideas of how that might be implemented without leading to increased socioeconomic uh, disparities of lifespan and overall income? Thank you. Yeah, um, the, it's a complex question. Right? Well, one of the things that I, I, I was struck by some of the earlier conversations, so I look back at some of our earlier estimates, in that um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion of income inequality both in the United States and, and worldwide. But if you actually look at the data, the way the, the gains in value, the way we calculate them over, over the last third of the 20th century, African Americans were converging to whites. They gained more in terms of, of value of uh, additional life years than than uh, than whites did. Um, additionally, if you look at it worldwide, you talked about inequality. That that's been con there's been convergence there too. So there's sort of spillovers of this technology into into other places. Now, you know, I don't know what the issues of allocation are going to come up. We might occur if we all start living in it. One of the scenarios is that we all live up to 150. You know, in terms of the, the sort of metaphor that was up there before, I already feel like I'm drooling on my shoes. <laughs> and, and, so, so uh, you know, I'm, I don't, I don't, I guess I don't view that as a great, great prospect. But how we're going to allocate medical care in that? I mean, it's an important question. Like. I mentioned last night that um, the, what's called the dependency ratio. If you're going to have social insurance programs that, that pay for um, public pensions and pay for uh, a lot of health care, well, you know, there's a transfer from those who work to those who are no longer working. And at, at current levels of benefits in a, in a lot of these systems, uh, an extension of a life year, uh, the expected lifetimes by just one year in, also implies that if you wanted to keep tax rates uh, fixed on the working population, then you're going to have to increase working lives by about 0.7 years for every additional year. Um, it isn't happening in a lot of the welfare states of, of Europe. Yeah, and one, one thing I would, I would say, I, I, don't, I think actually the dimension on which disparities have been increasing probably the most is really education. And that's really an artifact of, and you get into a world when there's more things you can do to affect your own health, then education is gonna play a bigger and bigger role. I mean, for example, as you move to more outpatient care and versus in a hospital, I mean, if you're anesthetized on a operating table, doesn't matter whether you got a PhD or quit in kindergarten, you're not really doing anything. The doctor's really <laughs> doing the work. But if you're required of monitoring your blood pressure, monitoring your diet, or doing all these other things, which we've increasingly done, then education plays a bigger role. And one place you do see differences in longevity emerging is on that education front. And Educated people are more skilled at a lot of things, and one of the things they're more skilled at is being healthy. Yeah, and, and as, you, as you expand the number of things you can do to live longer, you know, it, you know, when, when it was getting eaten by a, you know, a lion, it really <laughs> didn't matter how educated you were. It was just as tasty, no matter how much, how how educated you were. But when it really is these increasing things you can do for yourself, and I think that's for, frankly going to continue to increase. It's not, and it's not just in health. It's in financial planning. It's in raising your kids. It's, it's tons of dimensions on which education has become a really, really important question. Yeah, right here. Sorry to the mic person. We should kind of move more continuously. But Thank you. In very simple terms, could you please walk me through an analysis of Alzheimer's research and how you would... Uh, what? Alzheimer's oh, okay. research. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll do an aspect of it that I think is really important. Progress on different elements of health 
are interrelated and have what we call in economics a complementarity relationship. That is, the more progress you make on one dimension, the more important it is to make progress on the other. So for example, we've made tremendous progress in cardiovascular disease, which has allowed a lot of people to live beyond, you know, age 65 or 70, to live into their 80s and beyond, which is where Alzheimer's is a much bigger issue. So the value of progress against Alzheimer's is so much higher now because we've made progress against these other diseases. It wasn't even on your radar screen back when everybody keeled over from one hot shade depreciation at age 55. But it also, <laughs> now we're worried about it. Now it also goes the other way. If we're gonna make progress on longevity on other fronts, making progress on Alzheimer's is even more important for the same reason, right? Because now if we're gonna have more and more people living beyond into the years where Alzheimer's a risk, more and more gain. So I, I think Alzheimer's has risen in importance precisely because of all the other progress we've made. And progress against Alzheimer's is going to increase the value we receive from progress elsewhere. Because now if, I, now if I know I'm not going to have Alzheimer's, well, you know, like being alive is a, is a yeah. little bit better thing. So let's, let's make some progress, more progress against heart disease and so on. So it, it's not just Alzheimer's that Kevin was talking about. It's all these age-related diseases. Progress against one age-related disease raises the value of progress against other age-related diseases because you're going to be around to experience them. Yeah, exactly. Right here in the middle. Thank you. I'm Dan Perry. I had an organization here in town called the Alliance for Aging Research. As you might imagine, we've been fans of Murphy and Tappel ever since that paper came out. Um, going back to Joel Garreau's uh, uh, scenarios, which I thought were very useful, uh, it seems that by pursuing scenario A, which is where kind of the Washington Duke things as they've always been done, is going to get us to scenario B, which is probably the most distasteful, and scenario C, which is what I think you get most votes for, uh, is going to suffer. And quite frankly, I think scenario D works kind of against C, too, because it gets people off into... I, I can't remember all the scenarios. Well, <laughs> it, uh, D is the uh, immortality, which yeah, probably... Right. If, if what we really want is an extension of the health span, the healthy, vital years yes. of life, and realize the economic benefits of that, we're going to have to change in fundamental ways, and A is sort of do the same old, same old. So we've got to make changes, and you guys have really been out in front uh, from the chorus that generally says another dollar spent on medical innovation is just adding more to the deficit and it's a bad thing. So you've seen past that and I, and I salute you for that. One last thing, the big change coming in medical research in aging is going to be highlighted at a very important conference at the end of this month at the NIH where a new concept is emerging called geroscience, which is getting us past the, the, the silos of heart research, cancer research, Alzheimer's research, all separate, and getting at the underlying biological mechanisms that come with aging that all go to, that go to all of those different diseases. So whether it, you're AARP or Prudential or, or Slate, pay attention to this big summit conference on geroscience, the NIH, the 30th and 31st of this month. Thank you. That's well, my thank pen. you. I mean, Thanks. that's that's good because I think the complementarity that we just talked about earlier points to the value of kind of that balanced approach, right? You, you know, complements are like peanut butter and jelly. You know, you, you don't want to end up where you have a sandwich, but you only got the peanut butter, you only got the jelly. You need to have them both to really get the most value out of it. And I think that's an important important side of all this. So that sounds good. The the other side I think has been encouraging is you know this theme that we've been talking about which is thinking about cost effective solutions that and again ties in with everybody being able to access them broad access to cost effective solutions getting more evident more ev emphasis on the research side it's not just about is this treatment going to be better than the last one is it going to be cost effective is getting i think more attention in in those circles which i think is great i think it really is a key part of evaluating potential research directions. Yeah. I think, are we almost, how are we doing on time? I don't want to run over too much. We're okay. 
We're done. Oh, we're done. Oh, okay. Okay, one more. One more. Bob Rosenblatt, freelance writer. Um, my grasp of statistics is not what it should be. I want to make sure I understand this. The five trillion dollars from uh, ten percent reduction in heart disease and ten percent reduction in death rate cancer. Does that mean you apply a million dollars to each additional year of longevity, or how did you get the five uh, trillion? Uh, no, okay, well you're getting complicated. <laughs> the um, the w we used. Um, there's a scientific review panel at the Environmental Protection Agency and also at other government agencies. And they use a concept called the value of a statistical life to, for cost-benefit analyses. Like, it's going to cost us this much by improving road safety to, to save one life per year. Well, if it costs $47 million to improve the safety of the road and it saves $1 million a year, their number is $6 million per statistical life. It's not worth it on a cost-benefit analysis. But if it only costs 100000 to save that life, that's a pretty good deal. So we used a value of a statistical life, which is the sum of the life years over your entire life cycle, expressed in present value, la, 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 um, as $6 million. And then we backed out how that varied over people's lives as they age. It got closer to the end of life and so on. But we, so we're valuing life years at different rates. And you... You can admire it at your leisure when you when you look at the when you look at the papers. But that's the basic approach. Yeah, we, we tried to make an adjustment for variation in the value of life years at different point in the life cycle, and uh, I, you know that was one of the innovations we thought we had in our research. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you.